right? Let's see, folks, I, it, it, it's okay. So we've Chris started the broadcast team. now, Chairman. We're now live. We're now live. Well, welcome to everybody to this meeting of the Cultural and Community Select Committee. And it's being held remotely, and members are in attendance via video con conferencing. The meeting is being live streamed and will also be available for repeated viewing. Have I only just got live again? Shall I start again? You're okay. Uh, no, no, we heard you all right, Chem. Um, I'll begin by naming the members who are in attendance for the public record and asking them to confirm their attendance. Mm -hmm. And during the meeting, if a maker, member wishes to speak, they will indicate this to me and I will call them to speak in turn. And I'd like to remind members that the County Council standing orders continue to apply to please keep your microphone muted unless you have been called to speak and that you may be visible on the screen to the public and to, and to other members even when you're not speaking. I'm now going to call these members there's members in attendance and members, please unmute and confirm your attendance for the recording <coughs> and to ensure that you can be heard. Well, first one is Councillor Christopher Carter. Yes, he is there. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was late That's getting in, Chairman. I was in another meeting, but I am present now. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor John Benison. In, in attendance, Chairman. Yes, so. Councillor Fred Burkett. No, Fred Burkett. Councillor Jackie Branson. Uh, present Chairman. Uh, Councillor Anne Briggs. Present Chairman. Councillor Zilia Brooks. Present Chairman. Councillor Peter Chegwin. Uh, present Chairman. Yeah, okay. Councillor Daniel Clark. Present. Councillor Rod Cooper. Yes, present. Councillor Powell Hare. Present, Chairman. Councillor Dominic Hiscock. Yes, I'm present, Chairman. Councillor Rob McCatter. Yes, present, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I didn't know you there. Councillor Michael White. Present, Chairman. Right, well, welcome to you all. And I also see um, Oh, Councillor Edward Heron is there, but that's he's be coming up. He's very welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, I have apologies for absence. Are there any? We haven't received any apologies, Chairman. Um, and next, declarations of interest. And if you have a disclosable pecuniary interest or a personal interest in any agenda item, please do declare this either now or at the time of the item, item, item by indicating that you wish to speak. The next on the agenda is the confirmation of the minutes. And that's in the agenda pack. And that's a, a, the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 12th of January this year. And do members agree that these are correct? These are a correct record. Has anyone got any worries about anything? So I can agree that this is a correct record. Agreed. 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 I don't think we have any deputations. Is that right? That's correct, Chairman. No deputations today. So the next on the agenda um, is um, find it. my announcements. First of all, it's, I've got some news about the Hampshire Outdoor Centres, who are pleased to be working with the Government Kickstart Scheme, which encourages young people, that's 16 to 24 year olds, into, employ, um, into employment in the outdoor sector. And the service has been granted funding for five positions across three of its centres. One in Runways End, two in Tile Barn, and two more in the Hampshire Mountain Centre. 
and the successful candidates will be working for 25 hours a week, supporting all areas of centre operations. Also, um, Hampshire Outdoor Centres, the Countryside Service and the Sir Harold Hillier Gardens are looking forward to welcoming young people on educational visits back to their sites. And subject to imminent confirmation from the Department for Education, it is expected that school educational day visits will resume on the 29th of March and overnight residential visits from the, from the 17th of May with, spe with specific COVID secure measures in place. Secondly, news on the Hampshire libraries who have promoted a winter reading challenge during January and February encouraging children to enjoy and share stories with an email certificate at the end. Following the success of the online summer reading, reading challenge in 2020, challengers were encouraged to sign up and update their re reading records online. And over 2,000 children participated during lockdown by downloading e-books and e-audio books and by reading physical library books via the click and collect service. With the Census Online 2021 in full swing, regional ONS census support centres are now available in Hampshire, in Hampshire libraries to assist those who may struggle with completing their form because of limited digital access or skills. Telephone and COVID safe face to face appointments are available and can be and can be booked. Now the good piece of new, news there's the lookout at LEAP and I'm delighted to tell you that Hampshire County Council has won a prestigious National Design Award, a UK Civic Trust Award 2021, for the lookout at Leap Country Park. Um, and the lookout was designed by the multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary design team at Hampshire County Council Property Services. It replaced the old and updated visitor centre with a modern sustainable building which maximizes the location's outstanding views. The new visitor attraction opened in the summer of 2018 as part of a 2.9 million makeover at Leap Country Park. And whilst currently closed due to COVID-19 restrictions, it is a fantastic facility for people visiting the park. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. And it's one of because it's built up on stilts, so it can't be, it can't be flooded. Um, it, I think it's a wonderful place. And I'm sure you'll join with me in passing on congratulations to all involved. And that is the end of my communications. And next, I've got Felicity Rowe is going to talk about the summary of COVID impacts and recovery position. Felicity, can I hand over to you? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, hello, everybody. I'm actually um, coming from leave and I'm working in my mother's kitchen at the moment. And I've just realised I'm awfully sorry, but the potatoes are boiling very hard. There we go. I've turned them off. So, <laughs> sorry, that's, that's, that's what happens when you get. <laughs> so um, I, well, I've, I've sent through a, a paper and I, I won't um, go through everything in that paper because I think it says what it says. So um, I will obviously be willing to take questions on anything that's in there, but I just wanted to just give you a, a director's overview really of how I think we've coped with COVID. And um, I think overall the department's had a really um, amazing and as far as you can have it, good COVID journey. Um, and I'm, I think, overwhelmingly proud of um, everything that everyone right the way across the board has done. And I think it's really important to stress that because we have, I think, um, as a county council, shown um, our strength and depth in our staff and their ability to work in all sorts of strange situations and from all sorts of strange places. Um, and they have kept services going in um, circumstances that I think that this time last year, which is, um, you know, almost historically uh, just about a year, a year to the day, I think a year, week, a week, week on, isn't it? That total lockdown came in. Um, and um, we have remarkably just been able to keep everything going almost without skipping a beat. And I think that's a huge um, 
you know, we, we have to hugely acknowledge um, what the staff have done in that time and um, in very strange circumstances for many of them. Um, I just want to pull out a few highlights really um, of that journey. One is that if we look back a year, um, this time next week, we had to shut all our services in 24 hours, um, all the public facing ones. And we did that um, with remarkable calm, um, taking decisions we never thought we would have to um, in very short timelines and very short orders. And um, including things like how you shut buildings down safely, um, and we, we mustn't forget that in the course of that, an awful lot of staff have actually been in the office throughout this. The FM staff in particular, we all owe a huge debt of gratitude to um, right the way from making sure the post still circulates through the organisation to making sure that buildings were shut down without risk of Legionella's disease um, and bringing them up again without the same sort of thing happening. So um, if I take a, a few of the services, um, FM have um, been remarkable. They have not only managed to keep what I'd call normal services going, and that means staff have been in the buildings. They've been making sure the cleaning's been happening. They've been making sure that um, things are COVID secure. They've taken all the um, necessary actions to make each of our buildings COVID secure, and that's been a tremendous piece of work by FM. Um, they have also um, been really instrumental in making sure all the IT kit got out to all the staff in their homes, and that was, um, you know, a, a small miracle of, of peacetime operations um, in 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 style. They had all the chairs lined up in the underground car park, and as the staff came in, a chair and a computer was loaded into their boots, and they were sent on their way. And it was a um, quite an extraordinary piece of piece of uh, operations. So they've helped enormously there. Um, and then they've they've done things like um, yeah, FM was really instrumental in supporting temporary mortuary when it was at Southampton Airport. Um, they became renowned for turning up with bacon butties to um, sort of um, relieve tensions and 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 stress at times. Um, they also very recently um, helped support the um, COVID secure testing um, up at. Um, uh, I can't remember the name of the place now, when we were testing for the um, South African variant in one of our villages. And again, FM were instrumental in supporting um, in supporting that work and making sure that the operations ran smoothly. So it's it's been an interesting time for a group of staff who are often unsung um, because they have in their way become heroes over the year, I think. And um, if I had to single out any part of the department, it would probably be them as, um, you know, people who have kept things going um, when everything else has um, been in danger of falling apart. So well done them. And then um, the other people I want to pull out, particularly for you to just um, take note of in terms of um, um, what's what's been done over the years, the registration staff, again, a service that we don't often um, sort of see a lot of, um, but they do, they have done everything from supporting the coronial service, who have had quite a year of it. Um, they have taken on um, all the death registrations, which, as you can imagine, um, have been very up on um, sort of normal levels um, over the year um, and uh, people in very distressing circumstances. And we have dealt with that extremely well. And those staff who've done the death registrations have been in the office throughout um, because we didn't think it was right that people should be taking death registrations in their homes. That seemed um, a very wrong um, sort of um, juxtaposition of, of home life and work. So they've been in the office throughout, all socially distanced, all working in bubbles so that we never had a sort of um, any sort of wipeout in terms of, of, of a particular group of people. Um, and registration have also obviously also do all the marriages. And um, they have now got couples who have had to reorganize their wedding four or five times and still haven't got married yet. Um, and they have dealt with that incredibly sensitively. And I think um, the paper references um, what happened in November when lockdown was announced on a Saturday night and lockdown was going to start on the following Thursday. And the registration service on the Sunday um, Bear in mind, these are all low-paid staff. They all got together. They spent 14 hours collectively phoning all the people who were going to get married between Sunday and the following, sorry, between Thursday and the following Sunday. And they brought those weddings forward to Monday to Wednesday so that those people could get married um, before lockdown started. 
and the public sector you know sometimes perhaps gets a bit bashed um, for perhaps being a nine to five service or not caring etc and I think that we really showed that that's not the case um, I didn't instigate that I got told about it after it had been done I didn't have anything to do with it um, and it's those staff and the way they care about what they do that really really makes a difference and then um, that's perhaps you know one or two of the successes we we need to look across the board though at the way um, somewhere like libraries has had to handle a lot of different challenges um, not without its difficulties in a year when we have obviously done a huge undertaking in terms of the transformation of libraries um, and the staff have had to cope with an awful lot um, and some of them have found it tough um, particularly where they've been perhaps feeling more vulnerable and a library is a very public place. So some of the openings of the libraries um, in the times between lockdowns have been difficult for staff um, and um, we've had to sort of manage and, and help them cope with that. But um, those public services have proved their worth as well. And it's interesting now that a lot of people I think are asking why the libraries aren't open and the reason they're not open is because we're not allowed to open at the moment. And that's one of the things we've been doing. We've been following very carefully um, the government guidance throughout the last year so that um, been very careful to say that if we can be open, we will be. Um, and I think that has stood us in very good stead over the year, um, where I've looked at some other organisations who um, have, have perhaps been a bit more cautious. And I will put my you know, neck out there and say that if we, you know, we've been able to be open, we are open. And that has included things like um, the toilets at the country parks, which I know sounds a, a trivial thing, um, but was was decisions that was well made because um, what we found was that where toilets weren't open and I went certainly for a walk in one or two areas where the Forestry Commission hadn't opened their toilets um, and people's bowel movements um, continue whether or not you've got your toilets open um, and so actually having your toilets open is a very good thing um, for the local environment. So um, things like that have been you know, difficult decisions, um, decisions we've had to ask staff to, to cope with and to make sure they act in a COVID secure way. And I think we have done that throughout. The risk assessments that we have done, um, numerous, numerous risk assessments, which got signed off all of them at senior level so that we knew that there was senior responsibility for them. Um, we have now become very adept at um, managing these positions. And so I have huge confidence as we move now into a position where I hope we do a reopening for the final time and that we don't have to do any more lockdowns and I know that the whole country fervently hopes that um, that we will bring our services back up in a, um, a risk managed fashion that means that we can gradually open in a way that's safe for staff and safe for the public but also um, make sure that where I think there's going to be this huge feeling of untapped demand and, and desire to be out, that we can help people, um, you know, as, as people, and we are allowed out of lockdown, that we can help people enjoy that. And I think it's going to be really important that we're open for business right the way across the board and that um, we, we welcome people back with open arms. And that will be everything from um, the country parks becoming fully up to speed um, right the way through people, if they want to, coming back into the office. Um, and I really, really hope we're going to have a summer of weddings and fun um, in our country parks as well. So um, just perhaps finally then to touch on what happens around the office based staff. And this obviously is wider across the county council and not just um, in, in terms of CCBS, but I, I, I'm anticipating somebody might ask the question. So obviously um, the majority of the department staff actually aren't office based. So the majority of the department staff are out there on the front line, whether they're dealing with the Basingstoke Canal or they're on a county farm um, or they're doing whatever they're doing out there um, in, the, in, in, the, in a public role. And so that continues um, and we must always remember that those people are, um, have work bases that aren't offices. Those staff who are currently working from home because they are uh, much more office based, I think we will end up with a mixed approach as we go forward. Um, I'm, I'm very aware that there are some people who have found it you know, really easy and liberating perhaps to be working a lot from home and others for whom it's extremely difficult. 
And that really depends on personal circumstance. And so I hope that as we move forward, we're going to be able to offer staff more flexibility around where they work and how they work so that it fits in with um, their needs and their lifestyle, but also our needs and what our, um, you know, our, our different roles in, in the office or at work need us to do. But I certainly don't see a position where we'll be asking staff to be in the office for the sake of it. Um, I think we'll need to be much more sharp and sensible um, around why we need people to come together, um, and that's for their wants and needs, as well as the office's wants and needs, as it were. So um, that's all I wanted to say. Um, I hope that the paper's helpful, and I'm very open for questions on any part of um, what we're doing, but I hope that's given you a flavour of um, how things uh, have been over the last year for CCBS. Thank, thank you very much, Felicity, and uh, your report was extremely interesting, just seeing all the things that we probably didn't even think about continuing or even quite what they were. Um, one point that you did raise was um, volunteer hours have been significantly reduced, and I think quite a lot of that has been to do with the age of the actual volunteer. Am I, am I correct? Yes, um, an awful lot of our volunteers are uh, were in some way in vulnerable groups, so um, they, by law, um, couldn't um, join us. So some of our volunteers have been able to come back. Um, many others we are missing hugely because they, um, you know, what this really shows is what a vital part they play in the department's work. Um, you can particularly look at things like footpath management, um, some of the work in the country parks, um, and some of the work in our libraries. The volunteers make a huge and substantive difference, um, and so we are missing them hugely. But I hope they will also all be able to join us back in the summer. I know they're keen to, um, and we're all well, looking forward to welcoming them back. But yes, we didn't stop them, um, but there were lots of reasons why um, it, it was... Um, not a good thing or actually illegal for them to, to join us. I know, because I know oh, there's organisation Good Neighbours, you know that? Yes. Depended, all their workers were, were yeah. volunteers, and a yeah. lot of them were over age, and that was, I yeah. think they did manage to sort it out to some extent, but it does make older people feel a bit not wanted. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we, we absolutely desperately want them. And the absence of our volunteers for all the all the reasons uh, just stated um, has been really noted, noticeable. Yeah. Councillor Branson, you wanted to say something. Yes, um, you, you mentioned how well the staff had done, certainly in certain departments. I just really wondered um, if we were doing anything to thank them, you know, even just a letter or, you know, anything else, because obviously even from us or from you, um, obviously those that have done sort of beyond the call of duty, I think, you know, we need to recognise what they've done. In many, many ways, the staff have been thanked. I, I was doing a weekly um, message out to the staff for the whole of the first lockdown and certainly making sure that thank thanks went when they needed to. Um, we are, as a corporate management team, currently considering how we can, as a county council, thank staff. Um, and certainly if um, uh, the committee, select committee, wished to write to staff, then um, I will obviously be able to relay um, any such letter in, in their direction. Certainly, um, you know, uh, your thanks I can certainly convey, which however which way we want to put it, um, my thanks they have had. And um, at the end of each year, we look at um, special recognition payments for staff. Um, and certainly we have taken um, COVID into account um, as we have done special recognition payments across the system. So we are finding our ways to thank staff um, and, um, you know, there's, there's never enough um, that we can do, I think, on that front. Thank you. That's great. Now, and I think maybe we might add a recommendation when we get to the right time. Councillor Briggs. Thank you, Chairman. I just wondered how trading standards have managed doing it virtually um, during this time, because they are quite, they're, well, they're very important, especially with so much coming in online. I just wondered how it's worked. 
Yeah, it's it's been a mixed bag, I think, for trading standards. Some of it has worked. They've been able to do quite a lot of virtual support because a lot of their work is actually supporting organisations get things right rather than um, in part, uh, sort of enforcement when it goes wrong. So they've done been able to switch quite a lot of that online. They've been able to keep things like um, uh, the... Um, um, check a trade going so that sort of thing has been working and the animal welfare team has been particularly um, alert and they have gone out when they have needed to go out and in fact we did a, a very significant um, um, uh, intervention on a farm uh, uh, three or four weeks ago so um, where animal welfare has been necessary we've absolutely kept that going we've kept the, some of the port checks going um, where we've been able to be in you know, empty warehouses um, checking on um, contraband goods and um, um, goods that are sort of substandard. Um, some of it's online. Um, some of it inevitably um, we haven't been able to do. Some of the sort of what I'd call the more routine checks into weights and measures and things hasn't happened. We'll obviously be considering that once we come out of lockdown in terms of what the, um, what the checking regime is um, and, and making sure we catch up on some of, of what's been going on, what, what we've missed. That's good, thank you. And can I just say quickly to follow on from Councillor Branson, the staff at QE, which I use a lot, we use the dog field with our new rescue dog and you have to book obviously the day before and my husband would keep on doing it online late at night so we didn't get the code and the people there, because we'd left our telephone number, each morning before we arrived, they would ring us up and give us the code to get in for that day. And it's just little things. It's people who perhaps you won't know what a good job they've done. So I just felt like telling you. Thank you. And if I can just say to that, that has been that sort of attitude has been duplicated right the way across the board again and again and again over the last year. And it has been absolutely awesome in terms of the way the staff have responded to things. Yeah, it's been brilliant. Thank you. Councillor Benison. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much for the report. Very good. Um, necessity is the mother, mother of invention and, and you've certainly um, um, move staff around to make things work and I think uh, all of the committee uh, thank you for that and I, I suspect the chairman might be thinking and I would wholeheartedly agree that she might like to um, write to the staff from the committee and uh, send, them, send them all our thanks. I have three questions uh, please. Uh, one is about the libraries. Um, we were going to sort of do a phased um, change of the libraries over uh, over a year, I suppose, with some staff uh, moving on and uh, times uh, of the opening and all sorts of things like that. Um, how has that gone? And if we should ever open up completely normally, will we just go straight into the normal times on libraries, the, the, the revised times that, we, that we'd spoken about? Um, so that's the first question. Uh, second one is about asbestos. It may be in the report. Uh, I saw that it had been stopped. Um, has it restarted again? Um, and if so, is, if it hasn't, is there a backlog at all that we need to clear? Um, and the last one was um, the the uh, food, the ca the uh, cafes, and the restaurants are open for takeaway. Um, do we think that they may be open for sit-down meals on April the 12th? I think it is when we get um, when I think pubs are allowed to to open. Um, so those three questions, if I may, please. Great, thank you, Councillor Benson. Um, firstly, on the libraries, um, we we will obviously be opening, reopening in, well, firstly, let me go back one. We have gone right the way through now the, the transformation process so that the staff who are going to leave are have either left or are 
imminently going to um, exit from the county council so that that whole change process has now happened from a staffing point of view. Obviously, our planned um, opening hours um, changes have been um, severely hit by the fact we, we plunged into lockdown. Um, and what we're going to do is that um, because we're managing that sort of final bits of the swap over to staff, as we reopen um, in line with the, the law, um, the government guidance over the next couple of months, we'll probably be at around 75% of the new opening hours. Um, and what we plan to do is by the time we get to June, um, when all the restrictions are hopefully lifted, we will be fully on our new hours. And the reason we need to be just slightly sub opening the, the full um, new hours is that some of the, the COVID um, work, particularly around needing to quarantine library books for 72 hours um, and the um, a number of staff we need to ensure um, COVID compliance um, just does take a bit more resource. Um, and so we do need to just make sure that um, we, we, we can um, manage everyone's hours accordingly and everyone's workloads accordingly. So there'll be a slight um, sub sub the the new hours, but that should un unlock itself pretty quickly, um, and we hope to be fully open on the new hours by June. So I hope that answers that one. And then in terms of asbestos, um, we if we did stop, it was for a very short length of time. So um, asbestos service is fully up and running. Um, it's been very busy recently, um, and it, the, as, as far as I'm aware, there is no backlog, um, but we are just in a busy period. We shut down sort of um, construction work for a very short period of time in the first lockdown, but that rapidly came up again, um, and asbestos has been doing what I call sort of the normal activities um, around that um, subject to COVID um, secure um, needs over that period. So some things have been a bit disrupted um, where we've needed to be careful around um, how we manage things in schools, um, but um, the asbestos service is up and running properly um, now. Cafes, we will uh, reopen um, for internal seating, etc., in line um, with the government guidance on what we can do in terms of restaurants. We've stuck to that being in line with government guidance right the way through, and we'd plan to do that as we reopen on the um, cafes and restaurants in the country parks. I think that answers that. those questions, Councillor Benison. I'm now Councillor Makato. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Felicity. That, that was a, a really interesting report. I've got a couple of uh, follow-up questions. Um, the first one's almost a request about whether you can come back in about six months' time and talk to us again about new ways of working about what has actually stuck and what's changed. I think that's going to be, a f given the range of what we do, it'd be fascinating to actually keep us in touch with what actually has become more permanent. So that's a request to come back and brief us on that issue uh, later in the year. And the second question I have is about, you made a, a very salient point about the experience of the workforce varies enormously depending on what they do. I'm particularly interested in the experience of the workforce depending on how old they are and how senior they are. And my, my feeling from experience elsewhere is that the younger members of our workforce and less senior may have a very different experience of A, working from home given where they live, and B, the kind of jobs they do. And I'm very interested to see if we can track that experience of the experience and age of our workforce, how they felt uh, they, they've got on a lockdown. I'm, I'm very aware from talking to, uh, I have to say, people considerably younger than me in their 20s and 30s, that their experience of lockdown is very different to more senior friends of mine who are very happy working here. And I'm really interested to know whether that applies to our, our range of staff as well. Thank you. OK, um, certainly I'm very happy to come back. We'll take a look at what the timeline is on um, select committee dates. I suspect that we won't have a sort of proper bedding down of things by the summer. I think we probably ought to be looking at October or November type of time to be able to give you a feel of how things are changing if they are. Um, in terms of the age profile, I mean, it's quite interesting, Councillor Makata. I, I think it, I haven't seen a pattern um, in, in my own um, sort of feedback between younger and older, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to be really, really dependent on, on individual circumstances, although I think it would be fair to say that generically, um, the sort of slightly older 
middle class with um, larger houses and gardens have found this easier than the young people who might be stuck on their own in a bedsit. And, and that you can see the obvious reasons for that. We have been doing um, staff surveys as a county council. Um, and what I will do as a result of that question is go back and see if we have done any cuts across that by age. Um, We've definitely looked at it by ethnic um, profile, but I'm not sure if we've looked at it by age. The, the other side of the coin, though, is that the younger people, um, you know, anecdotally find things a lot easier in terms of being online all the time because it's actually how they live quite a bit of their social lives. Um, and so the sort of all day on teams doesn't probably worry them in the same way it might worry others. So I think there's some swings and roundabouts. And obviously a lot of our younger staff are the ones who are out there on countryside stuff and, and um, perhaps haven't had to be um, stuck at home the whole time because we've, we've been able to keep them, keep them working in the great outdoors. But I will pick that point up in terms of the younger, but I don't think from what I've seen so far that the age divide in terms of the personal experience is necessarily the, one of the defining features. There's probably a lot of other things that kick in as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hare. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you. That was a really good report and it's some really lovely, um, great questions and answers there. Um, can you tell me what's been happening with the citizenship ceremonies and are they going to go ahead? Um, yeah, we've been doing citizenship ceremonies in line again with government guidance. So they did stop for a while, but my understanding is that they are now, I'm pretty sure they're now online. Um, and I think we're also offering sort of private ones if, if need be. So they've definitely been, uh, I'm, I'm, not totally clear on exactly where we're at at the moment, um, but they've definitely been happening. Um, and they're one of the things that are sort of um, on, on the agenda in terms of making sure that citizenship ceremonies are, are going to go ahead again. So um, there's no shutdown or, or stopping of those. I know how important they are for people. So um, yeah, we're, we're definitely um, keeping them going. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any more questions or comments? So that takes us to the recommendation. And I don't know whether would you like to add something like the select committee would like to um, express our ad admiration and gratitude? Yes, for, yes. I'm very yeah, happy absolutely. to do that. Yeah, absolutely, happy Chairman. That. Be... Second, would, that, would that be a good one? Second, I think that would be you better wish. than... I wouldn't know where to start with sending them all a letter. Well, no. <laughs> no, not individually, letters. Chairman. I think. Well, would you? What? What would you like to say? Admiration and and um, and gratitude. I think Are those the words good. you'd like to use. Emma, I want to say well. And, yes, uh, if if we said something like admiration and gratitude, and, and request the director to pass on your thanks yes. to all staff, and I will make sure that uh, that happens. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Next, we have the county farms policy. Yes, we have. Haven't we? And who is going to be leading on that? Um, hello, Chairman. It's uh, me, Rebecca Thompson. Rebecca. Hello, uh, Rebecca. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll just introduce myself because I haven't been to the select committee before and um, members may not know me. So I'm Rebecca Thompson. I'm a strategic manager in property services. Um, and today I'm here to share with you the outcomes from the review of the county farms policy. And um, there was there's a paper in the pack, but also a presentation that you should have had um, it, from the pack. And I will just now bring that up, hopefully on the screen and make sure that, uh, that you're able to see that. Let's make sure. So perhaps if you could let me know if that's come up on your screens. Yes. Good. That's arrived. Yes, we can Excellent. see the beginning of it. Right, and hopefully the slides will move as I move them. So uh, the presentation uh, follows the content of the paper that's in the agenda pack. Um, 
I thought I'd start just um, initially. Hopefully that slide has moved on. It has. Yes, good. Uh, I would just uh, start with a little brief introduction to the County Farms Service. So the um, service was established um, early in the 20th century initially as the uh, County Small Holdings Service um, with the aim of supporting entry into farming um, and the, um, food production and providing um, employment for ex-servicemen. And Hampshire uh, is one of 43 council farm authorities in England and Wales. Um, and our county farms estate comprises um, in the region of 1900 hectares of land um, in approximately 30 locations. Um, and within that, there are 38 equipped farm holdings. And uh, it's a, we have a range of farm business types across the estate, uh, dairy, arable, um, horticulture and livestock farms um, and the farms do vary in size and, um, and the rental value and the nature of the businesses that they can sustain. Uh, the, the management of the county farms estate and the service operates within a legislative framework. So the county farms estate is a small holdings estate under the 1970 um, Agriculture Act. Um, and as a small holding authority, uh, the Act makes provision for the County Council to let the land and to provide opportunities for appropriately qualified persons to farm on their own account. Uh, the County Farms Estate is also covered by the provisions of the Local Government Act in so far as that confers the powers to sell and acquire land. And most recently, um, in November last year, uh, the new Agriculture Act came into effect, and this is clearly quite significant in relation to um, farming. Um, and uh, that follows the UK's exit from the EU in set and sets out a new agricultural system uh, where farmers and land managers in England will receive public money for public goods, which uh, includes such things as better air and water quality, uh, wildlife, soil health and measures to reduce flooding and tackle the effects of climate change. And that brings a new funding payment scheme for um, farming, which is the Environmental Land Management Scheme, and that will replace the current basic payment scheme, um, which is being phased out. The Act also um, empowers DEFRA to provide funding through a new entrance support scheme and we are awaiting further details on what that scheme will be but we have the opportunity to engage with the shaping of that scheme as well. So the review of the county farms policy was initiated in September 2019 and follows the intention set out in um, the executive member report of 2010 um, which identified regular reviews of the um, county farms policy at that time. And the aim of the review was to ensure that the policy provides a viable framework for the ongoing delivery of the service in the future, uh, taking account of the impact of Brexit um, and some of the emerging requirements linked to um, the climate change, the current environment bill and uh, the vision for Hampshire 2050 um, report and priorities identified. The review was delivered through an officer steering group um, in consultation and providing advice to a member advisory group um, and looked at a number of key themes which I've listed on, um, on the slide here. Um, we did manage, despite COVID, to have two days of farm visits last summer. And we were also um, engaged um, in continuous dialogue and through a, a formal questionnaire with our current tenants to seek feedback from them on the themes. Uh, in the following slides, I've summarized the findings of the review under four key headings and identified how we've taken those um, conclusions from the review and incorporated them into the new policy that's being brought forward for um, decision. So starting with um, tenancy, obviously the approach to farm tenancies is very much at the core of the county farm service and um, therefore the policy. 
and the review considered a number of aspects of tenancy arrangements, um, in particular, uh, looking at the balance between enabling new entrants to farming and supporting the progression of existing tenants within the estate, um, concluding that both starter and progression opportunities remain important in the service. And that was a view that was reflected back um, in the feedback from tenants. We considered tenant selection um, and that highlighted the importance of having an open and transparent process and seeking to um, have an inclusive and, and um, approach to tenants and the recruitment of new tenants uh, and also highlighted the importance of ongoing management of tenant performance. Uh, the County Council's role to provide support to tenants was something that was discussed in some detail um, and it was agreed that this should focus on facilitating collaboration between tenants, uh, opportunities for shared learning and development and signposting to wellbeing support, recognising that farming can be quite uh, an isolating um, profession and that um, the tenants would benefit from being able to access such support. Um, and we identified the opportunity to make uh, good use of social media and virtual meeting technology to, to provide that support to tenants and, and encourage the um, collaboration between our tenants. The new policy uh, reflects that enabling new entrants remains a principal aim of the County Farm Service, um, but does continue to make provision for progression opportunities for existing tenants where that is possible. The policy also sets out clearly the length of tenancies, both starter and progression tenancies, which align with the existing approach um, and highlights that the extension of the initial term is subject to the satisfactory performance of tenants. The policy sets out the intention for the County Council to take a proactive partnership approach to working with our tenants and to support them um, through regular dialogue and engagement by and by facilitating training and encouraging collaboration. And the first section of the policy document, which is a, um, at appendix one of the paper and provided in a, in a PDF format with the papers, um, sets out the provisions uh, for tenancy arrangements as the first section of that policy document. The second key theme that um, was considered within the review was the approach to land management and farming systems across the county farms estate and, and this was considered at some length during the review and the conclusions reflect the growing importance being placed on ensuring that we secure positive outcomes for the natural environment across our estate and particularly our rural estate and addressing the challenges of climate change in line with the county council's climate change strategy the review identified a requirement for high standards of animal welfare and for ensuring that we have sustainable land management practices on our estate and concluded that these expectations are best evidenced through um, third party assurance schemes. We spent some time considering the wider social and economic benefits offered by the county farm service, including such things as enabling rights of way for rec recreational purposes and some of the community benefits afforded by the farm diversification um, that some of our tenants have um, where they operate such things as farm shops, milk vending machines, um, all of which have proved a particular success with the local communities during the last year of, um, with the pandemic. I think the feedback we received from the tenants highlighted many um, examples of the excellent work that our tenants were already doing in this area um, with many of them already participating in assurance schemes. So taking account of the conclusions reached uh, by the review, the policy clearly states that food production remains at the core of our farm service, but it does place much greater emphasis on achieving high quality environmental outcomes. The County Council uh, will identify environmental priorities for each farms, um, which we will then ask the tenants to respond to in their business plans. And this will be a key area of partnership working with our tenants going forward, aligning very much with the public money for public goods approach of the new environmental land management scheme, as well as our own climate change and natural environment priorities.
The policy will also require tenants to adopt a sustainable farming system and sets an expectation that tenants will have membership of an appropriate assurance scheme. The policy encourages innovation and farm diversification, particularly where this contributes to the local economy and integrates those farm businesses into their local communities. And the policy provisions in this area of land management and farming systems are in, are in the second section of the policy document. We looked at financial arrangements for the service, uh, taking account of operational income and costs, rental values and landlord and tenant obligations in regard to the ongoing maintenance and investment in the estate. It was agreed that the operational service should continue to be funded from income, seeking to break even or make a small contribution to overheads. It also concluded that rent should continue to be set at market levels, but recognised that there is a degree of flexibility that's required uh, to account for specific circumstances. And a number of tenants made reference in their feedback to the financial challenges of establishing a new farm business. The need for ongoing capital investment to maintain the condition of the estate was noted. Um, and it was recognised that tenants may have more opportunity to secure external grant funding. So again, another area where partnership working with our tenants is really important. So the policy uh, provisions reflect the, these conclusions from the review and provide a suitable financial framework uh, that maintains the focus on supporting our tenants to establish their farm businesses through a partnership approach. And this is set out in the third section of the policy document. Finally, we looked at the farm estate itself and uh, considered the scale and diversity, how it's organised and managed to provide the best opportunities for tenants. It was agreed in the review that the size of the estate is best measured by total, total acreage rather than the number of individual holdings with support for having a flexible approach to how land is allocated to create holdings as the opportunity arises um, to recruit new tenants. There was agreement that maintaining a diversity of farm types was, was beneficial um, rather than focusing on any particular sector the allocation of county farms land for development as part of the County Council's strategic land programme and the capital receipts that this provides for reinvestment in the County Council's strategic priorities was recognised as an important aspect of the county farms estate. However, there was, a strong, there was strong support for maintaining the scale of the estate through a farm replacement programme. And there is an agreed corporate approach to facilitate land purchase although it was recognised that, that there are challenges um, in identifying the suitable land and that there is further work in this area to consider how we best engaged in, in this specialist market with the necessary um, agility. The policy um, reflects those conclusions, um, demonstrates the County Council's ongoing commitment to the ca County Farm Service and the opportunities afforded by considering the management of the county farms estate in the context of the wider rural portfolio with flexibility across. And the policy also recognises the importance of managing carefully the transition where we do identify land um, for alternative uses in order to minimise any adverse impact on the tenants and their businesses. And the final section of the policy document captures these uh, provisions in relation to the county farms estate. We did look as part of the review and there's a brief summary in the paper on the performance of the county farms estate and, and in the context of council farms um, nationally and that very much highlighted the important role that council farms continue to play in the um, let land sector. Uh, while Hampshire County Farms Estate is only a small in the scheme of all uh, council farms, it, the uh, indicators that we considered in the review demonstrated that it performs well on a number of these in terms of um, 
the number of uh, new entrant opportunities it provides and the length of ten tenants, tenancies that it um, offers. Most of our farms, despite the challenges of the pandemic, have performed well over the last year and there has been real success um, with some of the initiatives such as um, on-farm milk vending machines, the farm shops and um, the farm at uh, Lower Bronwich that runs the box fresh food delivery business, which was one of the uh, farms that we visited uh, during the review, who um, in a very timely way had expanded to a national level just ahead of the pandemic, but provided a really excellent service to local communities um, during the initial lockdown. There's an increased emphasis on performance in the new policy, and we do propose to bring an annual performance report to the executive member um, in the future. We looked at the financial arrangements for the service, um, and uh, I made reference to this earlier. It is expected that the operational provisions of the policy can be implemented within current revenue resources. And I've noted as well that um, there's capital investment of just under 2.4 million identified in the 21-22 capital programme to address some essential maintenance and compliance schemes across the estate. Although we recognise that it will be necessary to continue to seek opportunities to secure additional grant funding in order to um, continue to invest in the estate. We have undertaken an equality impact assessment in relation to the new policy um, and we uh, considered uh, inclusion and diversity during the review. We acknowledged that there is uh, a lack of diversity in, in the farming sector as a whole um, and recognised that taking an open and inclusive approach to the recruitment of new tenants is the first step in removing some of the barriers, um, and this is reflected um, in the policy. We also um, specifically considered climate change, um, and that is very much an integral part of the new policy. Um, and we will continue to work closely with our colleagues and our tenants to ensure that the County Farms Estate is responding to the challenges of climate change and um, working towards the targets that the County Council has set and that apply across our um, both our land and our, our built estate. So to conclude, um, we're confident that the um, County Farms Review has considered the uh, important um, factors that are influencing the future of the service and that the policy that we are bringing forward um, sets out uh, to ensure, sets out a, an approach that ensures that there continues to be a viable framework for the delivery of the, the service going forward, taking account of the changes that are coming in the agricultural sector nationally. And we're confident that it's a forward thinking approach that retains the focus on farming and food production and supporting new entrants into this important sector, whilst also reflecting the increased and growing emphasis on securing high quality environmental outcomes for, for the estate for the benefit of all of our communities in Hampshire. And that's the end of the, the presentation. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, Chairman. Rebecca, thank you very much indeed. And I, I, I was part of the team looking at this and I found it incredibly interesting. In many ways, lots of encourage, very encouraging. I think I've got some. I've got Councillor Briggs, who wants to ask something. Yes. Thank you, Chairman, um, and thank you very much, Rebecca, for that report. I've been on this committee quite a long time, and it's really, I think, the only really good report I've had on it. And one of my questions is, please. You've got a, a young, successful new tenant in, on the farm, and some of the tenancies are only for five or seven years. What happens to them afterwards? Thank you. Um, so the the um, tenancy lengths that are set out in, in the new policy, so if it's a starter holding, if it's a, a new entrant, is um, for seven plus 
three years. So it's a discretionary three-year extension to an initial seven-year term. But certainly our aspiration is that tenants would be successful in, in remaining for the full 10-year initial term, which we discussed as part of the review and felt that that gave um, sufficient, the right length of time for tenants to be able to establish their businesses with the appropriate support. Um, we discussed the uh, whether we could continue to provide progression opportunities for tenants, existing tenants within the service and concluded that it was a really important part of the service, but recognised equally that the scale of our county farms estate means that it's not always possible to do that. However, the policy does set out that we would seek to continue to provide progression opportunities for existing tenants where we can. And that could potentially lead to an, a further 15 year tenancy um, for a progression holding. Um, however, it's also our ambition through this, this policy to support the tenants um, in that initial starter tenancy so that they are best placed to also seek opportunities outside the county farms estate at, at the appropriate point so that they can establish their businesses for the longer term because you know that is the core purpose of the county farms estate so we would certainly be looking to work with our tenants to help them identify suitable opportunities at the right time and support them in in seeking to secure those opportunities okay may i ask one more question please chairman yes you may Thank you. You've got seven lifetime tenants. Is that the dairy farmers? Because that would be very hard to change and we need to encourage our dairy farmers because every day so many dairy farmers go out of business and as I walk a lot, the countryside is heartbreaking. You see all these empty farms. So I just want to make sure we're doing all our best to support our dairy farmers. We certainly are um, working hard to support our, our dairy farmers and work closely with them. Um, there are obviously uh, tenancy legislation has changed over the years. Um, and so there are still some um, tenancies within the service that come under the previous iterations of tenancy agreements. Um, but we're working closely with those tenants to ensure that um, you know there's an appropriate agreement on the way forward on those and what the future holds for those. And, and that number has, has decreased naturally um, over time since um, the last policy report was brought in 2010. Um, but, but certainly dairy still remains an important part of the county farm service and we absolutely expect to continue to, to support that. And, and I think the success of the milk vending machines has been a you know, really positive yeah. outcome um, in recent times for, for those dairy farms and, and their local communities. Thank you. And, and very quickly, what do you call bare land? Is that what I would have called set aside at one time? What is um, that's a good question, and I'm not sure I'm best placed to answer it, to be honest. I'm not the agricultural expert here, um, and I don't know whether um, Joe Heath is, is um, on the line, but um, yes, I, I think that is the case. We, so we have the, the main holdings which are farmed and support that, and then we have some other elements of land, some of which we let for grazing and some of which is better land. Thank you very much. I think Councillor Heron wants to come in on that. Jeremy, I can just help. Bare land is effectively land that hasn't got a supporting infrastructure with it. So if it was if it was just a field or or, or something, that that would be considered bare land, whereas uh, other land would form part of a, a, a holding or a structure. Thank you. Well, next I've got Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Madam uh, uh, Chairman. Um, my question is: um, Do we have hundred percent? take up of, of our farming land stock. Um, if that is the case, um, what is the level of interest? Uh, is there any sort of, put it bluntly, any waiting list, any uh, mass of people sort of looking to get into farming? And thirdly, um, going on from that further, is there any, if there is a, a, quite a demand for um, land and to get into farming. Is there any plan to expand our holding if possible? Thank you. Um, so we have some tenancy opportunities that are um, coming up 
um, in the coming period. In fact, I think we've got one that is uh, ready to uh, advertise and recruit a new tenant for very shortly. Um, so we always go for new starter uh, starter opportunities, new entrant opportunities, we go to an open recruitment process and um, we seek uh, expressions of interest through a structured process for that. And we would expect to be successful in recruiting a suitable tenant. Um, uh, and, and I think we've had quite a lot of success in recruiting good tenants. Um, so we would expect uh, to be successful this time. And I think we've also got a couple of um, further um, tenancies due to come up for opportunities in the next um, year or so. Um, so yes, we have 100% take up at the moment. Um, I think, was there a second part to that question? Apologies. Yes, Rebecca, shall yep. I just come in on that wider issue of um, is there a waiting list and should we have more farms? Um, oh, yeah, more farms. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it'd be fair to say there's probably um, fairly strong competition for any tenancy of ours that comes up because they're, they're good things to have. Um, so, but in terms of should we have more farms, the intention at the moment is to keep the county farms estate at approximately the size it is at the moment. We obviously, um, some of the estate is used as a um, strategic housing land supply um, when the moment comes. And so our focus at the moment is on how we um, replace county farm land that has been given up for strategic housing. Um, and to be honest, I think we're going to be, you know, hard put in terms of um, available land supply, a, a cost that we can um, we can afford as a county council. We're going to be hard pushed to maintain um, the size of the estate. So I don't, there would be no plans at the moment to expand that. Um, but um, maintenance of, of the overall size is um, where we will, we will aim to be over the next um, few years or decades. Thank you. I've now got Councillor Benison and then Councillor Makata and then Councillor Hiscock. So probably need to move on after that. OK, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for your um, for your report. Um, very straightforward to read and to understand. So thank you for that. Um, I've got a question on um, it says in the report identifies that the county council will set out environmental and social priorities for each farm to enable the tenants to respond to these in their business plan are we going to tell farmers how to farm are we going to i've got a couple of questions i'll give you them all at once and then you can uh, uh, if i may um so uh, that's that's the first um question please um the other one was about the age of the new tenants coming in. You did mention that the average age for farmers was 60. And I just wondered what sort of age that the, uh, the tenants, the new tenants that we have, whether they are on the um, progressive uh, holdings or on the starter holdings. Um, and what sort of um, qualifications do they have as well, please? I think that'll do, Chairman, as you want to move on. Thank you. Well, I think we need to. Um, thank you. Um, we're not going to tell farmers how to farm. Um, I think um, what we've set out and what we've been discussing is the importance of considering the opportunities that the county farms estate can offer in terms particularly of natural environment outcomes um, as well as, as the social benefits um, because we know our land and we know it well and we understand how it fits within the wider landscape of both the county council's rural portfolio but also the work that um, Joe Heath and the countryside team are doing with um, the Wildlife Trust and, and other organisations looking um, at Hampshire's natural environment. So the aim is that we can identify where we see the opportunities and how that fits within the wider um, Hampshire rural estate um, so that the tenants have that information when they're putting their business plan together they can put it in the context of what we know about our own estate and about Hampshire and, and it gives them um, 
more information with which to respond to and plan for and um, tailor their their farm businesses and their farming systems to suit the particular holding that we are um, opening up for offer. But we think it's really important that as a responsible landlord um, looking after the rural estate in Hampshire, that you know, we, we take an active interest in what the opportunities are and ensuring that we secure those high quality outcomes um, from the estate. So that's the aim there. And it's very much about working in partnership and drawing on the expertise that our tenants can bring with them. The, the, I, why I asked the question is that we're going to be planting a million trees over the next so so many years. And I was wondering whether we were going to ask farmers to put some of those trees on their land. I think it depends on the opportunity. So I think there, there are opportunities that need to be explored. Uh, and the new environmental land management scheme obviously offers um, some uh, funding that will come with that and there's quite a lot still to learn around that but that's where I think it's very much about partnership working both um, with our colleagues in the countryside service and with our tenants. Um, we, um, You asked about the age of new tenants um, and qualifications and qualifications yes um, so we are um, I mean, the average age of farmers uh, in in um, the UK is, I think it's, it's about 59 or 60 in the last um, statistics. We certainly have new tenants who are younger than that. We've got some with quite young families who have joined the estate and, and, um, and certainly we want to encourage uh, people into the estate who, you know, are, are going to make a, a career and a business in, in the farm, in the farming industry. So, but... It, it all comes down to the best proposal that we get when we when we open the opportunity up to the market, um, and and that's very dependent on the proposals that come forward for the particular holding um, that we that we've got available. But clearly, we want to encourage sustainability in the industry. Um, tenants, I think uh, the. There's some discussion going at the moment. So we do have um, some tenant criteria. It does require that tenants have got suitable qualifications and experience in the sector and working in the industry. Um, but the, the new entrant scheme that is highlighted that DEFRA is looking to develop, I think that is going to be part of the discussion um, that's going to be ongoing around what constitutes a new entrant um, what sort of level of experience and qualification would would be considered appropriate to classify somebody as a new entrant and we are expecting to participate in that discussion to help shape what that scheme looks like um, so it may well be that the level of experience and qualification will slightly change and we will adapt with that depending on on how that moves thank you thank you i think Jo looked as if she wanted to add something. Okay, then it takes me on to, to Councillor Makata. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, I, I, for the presentation. I've got one quick question. You put up a slide talking about seeking to maintain the scale, quality and diversity of the estate. And I wanted to ask about that. Obviously, 2,000 hectares and 43 farms looks like, a, like 100 acre farms. That's tiny, isn't it? And that's one of the issues, that trade-off between really quite small farms. You need very high quality to be able to, as you said, make a viable, sustainable living as a farmer on a 100 acre farm. And I'm just interested in whether we had a thought about whether uh, we should have fewer tenancies of a larger size in order to make them more sustainable and more viable given the fact that I believe the quality of our land in the farms is not of the highest agricultural grade on most of the farms. Am I correct in that? Yes, um, that's a good question. And it is one of the, the things that we talked about during the review. And uh, hence the conclusion that we should measure the scale of the estate by total um, hectareage rather than by the number of holdings because we recognise that there could be benefit into where we can, where, where we have um, land and, and, and more than one holding in a particular location. There could be benefit to being flexible in how we allocate the land to holdings to create the best opportunities at the time that, that those opportunities become available. And we also see opportunities um, in working closely with the countryside service across the broader rural estate to have flexibility across both the, the farms and um, the countryside estate 
where we also have farming activity to, again, look for those opportunities to create um, viable uh, holdings for our tenants and to work with our tenants on, on getting the best outcomes from our land. So that flexibility is, is very much um, in our minds as we move forward. Um, and uh, the leadership that Joe will be providing for um, County Farms service as well as um, the countryside service offers real opportunity for the synergies that exist between those two areas. Thank you. And, and now it's Councillor Hiscock. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, given part of the answer you just gave now about the scale of the farms um, and the enormous contribution that farms make to global warming and greenhouse gases, what sort of advice and support are, are we actually able to give our tenants to help them reduce the carbon footprint of their farms? Um, thank you. Uh, we've we've done quite a lot of work quite recently in relation to the um, County Council's climate change strategy and particularly the approach where we've been examining our own estate and our own activities and, and the, the strategy for that. And that has included seeking to get some baseline uh, measurements, quantification of um, carbon emissions from the county farms estate. So we've been doing quite a lot of work in that area recently. Um, and I think there's more to be done to understand you know, what, what the best strategies are to work with farmers. And actually the, the feedback from our tenants shows that they're already beginning to think about this a lot as well. You know, these are climate changes is something that's already impacting on their their farming practices um, and their considerations in, in uh, to the future. So they um, are already working in this area. So it's an area where we will be working very closely with them to understand um, measures that they are already, already planning to implement around you know, whether that's types of crops or, or um, we're doing a lot of work around um, nitrate vulnerable zones and and the impact all of which relates to, to carbon emissions so i think it's an area in progress where best practice is still being established but the sector as a whole the agricultural sector has set itself challenging targets and so we'll be looking very much to work you know within that remit with our tenants to to achieve the targets that have been set out for the county council that's great thank you very much thank you thank you chairman well thank you I found it all very interesting um, and some interesting things about the ages of the farmers too because that's relatively old isn't it um, and anyhow and the whole thing about small farms is very interesting these days because I think they're incredibly important um, in fact, I'm reading a, a wonderful book at the moment which is really about them called English pastoral do you know this one by somebody called James Rebanks, who is a small farmer himself. And it's actually wonderful, and it certainly makes you realise quite a lot of, of a picture of the 20th century, if you like, of how farming changed in, in various ways. Anyhow, very interesting. And let's come on to the recommendation. And that is the first one is that we approve the new county farms policy set out at appendix one and note the future leadership of the county farm service will be provided by the interim assistant director for recreation and natural environment in ccbs do we know who that is it's joe isn't it yes, yes it's joe, joe Heath. ah that's your new title i just checked you on you you're not on the website on that title <laughs> i was just trying to find out whether it was you <laughs> <laughs> I think it is, Joe, and I'm sure that's very welcome. Um, and note the intention to bring forward an annual performance report for the County Farm, farm Service commencing in 2022. Chairman, we do need to just take a short vote on this item because we are making proposals up to the executive oh. member for decision. So I will just launch an electronic poll that members will be familiar with. Because yes, we have to just briefly all. cast your vote. Thank you. Ch Chairman, I'm having access problems and I can't access the vote, but I'm in favour, Councillor Chegwin. 
Thank you, Councillor Chegwin. And I can see that all other members are voting for, Chairman, so those recommendations are carried. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Now, next we've got... Oh, I've, got I've lost... Here we are. Rights of way and countryside paths. And I think I'm handing over to Jo, is that right? You are, Chairman, thank you. Um, and thank you for that. Yes, I was going to update you on my new job title at the moment, which is Interim Assistant Director of Natural Environment and Recreation, which means that um, as well as countryside, I have the outdoor service is now in my portfolio as well as uh, Hilliers, so Harold Hillier Gardens. So very exciting um, change there. I will just see if I can get the presentation up. Loading, and hopefully you can see this. Yes. Nods. Thank you. Thank you. And I really do welcome this opportunity to update members on the use uh, of the countryside, particularly rights of way and countryside paths over the past year and the impact that that's had on the countryside. We started this conversation at the beginning, um, but also uh, it, this leads on, I think, from some questions that came out of the last presentation I gave to select committee with members asking questions around the use of rights of way. So um, I hope you'll find this interesting. Um, and this follows a recommendation to an executive member for a decision on how we're going to uh, look at recovery and um, path recovery program that we're proposing as our way of being able to mitigate some of the impacts that have happened over the past year. Uh, hopefully that's moved on. I'll just check that. Yes, it has. Thank you very much. So just a reminder about our public rights of way network in Hampshire. Um, I'm sure you're all aware, but just for completeness, really, just to say that we have quite a, a large um, rights of way network. Uh, it comprises mainly footpaths, which is not unusual, bridleways. We have restricted byways and boats. And to give an indication of who's able to use what, um, just on the right hand side there. It's important to remember that public have a right only to pass and repass. That means that they don't have a right to wander off the path. They don't have a right to stop and picnic even. So um, it is only a right to, to pass and repass. And many of the routes that we have um, across the whole country actually are uh, historical routes. And we are talking about rural routes here. So, we, you know, the routes that take across privately owned land, many, uh, much of them are across private estates, privately owned land. Um, and that includes um, farmers that we've just been talking about our own included in that. Um, but we also have in this county a lot of promoted routes. And um, these include just some photos here showing just the um, sort of scale and range of different promoted routes that we have in Hampshire. Got the Shipwrights Way, the South Downs Way, Itchen Way and the Milne Valley Trail that's just um, a snapshot really of those, but they do go across some of the, the best parts of Hampshire's countryside. And when we're looking at um, the management of public rights of way, um, I wanted to just remind people that we remind members that we have a statutory duty to to maintain those rights in a fit state for public use for the use in which they were intended. So as a footpath, um, it's their legal use is by foot. So uh, to maintain that right for people to be able to pass and repass on foot. We also um, need to maintain the legal record and this is the legal record of rights of way. Um, it's on a definitive map and it also has a definitive statement that describes that right and um, our role is to manage that including any changes that come forward um, through application. Physically that means that we're responsible for the surface even if it's across private land and we are responsible for signposting from the highway and where there are bridges and some other structures, then again, that is Hampshire County Council's responsibility as the highway authority. Landowners are responsible for stiles and gates. And this is an area I think that often gets a bit confused, partly because we do support a lot of um, improvements to stiles and gates across the county. 
And landowners must also make sure that they do not obstruct a right of way, that they keep it clear and accessible. Parish councils are the only other authority that have some due, uh, some powers with, with regards to public rights of way. So they don't have any duties, but it, they do. They are able to work on rights of way without asking permission from us. So that's just um, something we off Therefore, we work a lot with parish councils. Rights of way are increase, uh, incredibly important to um, our rural parishes. And so uh, we work with them to try and manage and help manage um, rights of way in their particular parishes. In terms of how we manage that, well, we have um, over 3,000 bridges on our network. And so we have a bridge in inspection programme that we work with colleagues in CCBS to undertake. We have a priority vegetation cutting list where uh, contractors undertake cutting. So this is vegetation removal to make sure that rights of way are open and accessible. Uh, contractors undertake some of that and our own teams do so too. And we also have a lot of volunteer groups and you talked earlier about volunteers. Um, a lot of the volunteers that work for us work in groups and so we were unable to obviously keep those working, not only because of the age group, but actually because they work as teams um, during COVID. So we did lose an awful lot of hours where what we were able to do was to keep some of the path inspections and our path wardens out. And they were going out for their daily exercise and reporting to us on any issues on the network, for example, and undertaking some minor works where they could And then beyond the network, so aside from the rights of way network, we clearly have um, an owner manage around 3000 hectares of land. And that in itself is nearly all publicly um, accessible. So from our country parks to all of our countryside sites and not forgetting, of course, the Basingstoke Canal towpath, which is 32 miles across Hampshire and Surrey. And all of these um, areas encourage people to explore, walk, cycle, be active in the outdoors, as well as connecting with nature, particularly important for some of our nature reserves and access you know, is necessary to be able to do that. I think I um, presented to uh, select committee last year on the, the research that we did um, around re COVID recovery and in particular about the likelihood of people continuing to visit our country parks once we were through and out of the other side of COVID recovery. But I wanted to just um, remind members of that and also just to pick out some um, key elements that really have that we're really taking account of when we're looking at the future use and enjoyment of the countryside. So we did this work in uh, June 2020 and what that showed us was that there is evidence of increased use and I think we're seeing that anecdotally as well as um, through some of the methods we have of monitoring use but also that we have seen a significant rise in the appreciation of the countryside and in terms of the value for people's mental and physical health and well-being. And it's a recognition from many of those people that uh, it's become more important since COVID and that they're likely to maintain that level of activity as well. I think that definitely um, looking at more staycations again this year, which will again encourage people to use and enjoy um, our countryside, including those in Hampshire, um, rather than going away. So really positive in terms of people, how people are feeling about using the countryside and the fact that, that we've probably got new people that have never used the countryside before going out and enjoying it. And I just included the infographic of the survey results just for your reference, really. I've pulled out the key, key elements I wanted to share with you today. So what we've seen is um, that our visits to countryside, country parks has risen by between 120 and 160 percent over the last six months. And despite that's despite our reduced catering, reduced activities, you're obviously not running any events um, of late either for mu much of that period. W there's been a significant rise in the use of the Basic Canal towpath, including um, cycle use, which has been up in places. Um, as well as use of the water itself. And 
um, at the moment we don't uh, actually monitor footfall on our on our rights of way. It's very difficult to do on over um, 2,800 miles of rights of way. What we do is um, we do have an online reporting system that I'm sure members are very well aware of, and we have seen an increase in the reports coming through, uh, which always indicates the fact that people are out, out and about a bit more, as well as potentially some of the issues that we've encountered on the rights of way network as well. Um, over the period that has levelled out a bit more, but in some months we were seeing as much as a 60% rise in the number of reports that we had. So if we compared November last year to the year before, for example. And the impact that we've that's resulted in is um, an increase in antisocial behaviour. So people straying off paths, picnicking, wild camping, barbecues, um, all that activity, an increase in littering. And we launched a littering campaign last year, which um, the sign I've put up here, um, based on a New Zealand sign, but toned down somewhat if you've seen the New Zealand sign. Um, and this was really well received by other authorities as well. So we made it available to them to use um, using their own logos as well as uh, referencing ours as well, so that we have some common language across the um, countryside. We started a hashtag walk the right way social media tag, and that was around encouraging responsible use, so helping people to share their good walks and how much they're enjoying it, but also how to use it responsibly. And we have done a lot of work in supporting and responding to landowner requests and parish councils coming to us with their concerns. There were issues where landowners had really had enough and they were um, making it very difficult for people to exercise their right to pass repass. So we had to work with them to look at how we could reduce and mitigate the impact that they had, that people were having on their land. Um, we obviously had um, reviews, reduced volunteer time um, so that had an impact on the work that we would normally be able to do on the network and we were unable to run our normal vegetation cut contract. So what we did last year was um, we all clubbed together and those people working in country parks and other parts of the countryside service all uh, lent a hand and got out and did some vegetation cutting across the network to try and um, reduce um, the impact of not having the vegetation contract had on the network. And because we're expecting to see um, a continued use and enjoyment, we are expecting to see some continued um, impact as well. So we're gearing up this year for a similar um, response. We're also devising some parish pages, which is not just for parish councils, but will be for landowners as well, where they can actually download some of the signage um, to help manage the situation without having to come to us each time as well, which I think will be really helpful. So increased use, lots of footfall, cycling, um, uh, more cycles, because there's lots of cycles being sold, more dogs on the network as well. Um, all of that uh, means that uh, there's been lots of um, footfall, lots of churning up of mud and uh, the surface of roots and of course on top of that you've got then um, very wet autumn and winter I think the 3rd of October was the wettest day for 10 years um, and that has had a massive impact on our roots and some places worse than others um, it has meant that uh, and if any of you are out there walking at the moment will know that there's quite a lot of spread as people trying to avoid the worst patches are just walking out further and further. And you can see an example here of this field where actually it's just become a very wide, wide path. It should only be a metre. It's, you know, three and a half, four metres at places. And this is encroaching onto people's farmland, onto their productive land, as well as onto some of the sensitive habitats as well. Um, so, so we, um, in discussion in, in the department, we uh, came up with the idea of really we needed to, to think about how do we respond to that and how do we um, carry out works that we need to do in order to keep these routes that are clearly, you know, being well enjoyed, open and uh, used in the long term. So 
um, through a CCBS accumulated cost of change reserve, we've allocated half a million pounds, five hundred thousand pounds, to spend this year in undertaking works across the network, including um, countryside paths that are in the country parks and other countryside sites as well, which is fantastically welcome. Um, but we need to find a way of doing it because £500,000 is a lot of money, but it's um, and a lot more than we actually would normally spend. But still, there are a lot of routes out there and we're not going to be able to, unfortunately, achieve every single route. So we have put um, together some criteria to help us with prioritisation of routes. And there's sort of three main areas of prioritisation, and this is being presented for decision tomorrow as well. So. Where is the path, type and location, how important it is in connecting other routes as well in the network, um, and whether it goes through sensitive habitats or farmlands, how much it's been damaged, so whether it's essentially not open. Now, I know we've talked um, earlier about, yes, you're out in the countryside, and so therefore, during the wet weather, you would perhaps expect people to wear wellies, I think it's more about the long-term impact it has actually on the path as well, being able to be used and the damage that it's doing to that and the surrounding areas that we need to take into consideration. Um, as well as then what the community concern has been. And we do have also, um, because I know that um, residents write to their MPs, local councillors and parish councillors about the state of the network. So if it's been reported through them, then um, we have a way of just recording that as well. And so this really helps us to um, gather that data together. And we already have, we know around at the time of writing, 76 or so routes that have been identified that have been damaged through uh, the amount of use coupled with the weather. Um, and so we're running these through the prioritisation to see which ones um, we should be uh, doing the work on this year and ensuring that they actually, um, uh, it's across the whole county as well. So we're not favouring one area of the county particularly. Uh, we are splitting the funding across rights of way, country parks and sites, and including the um, Basingstoke Canal towpath. And the type of work that we'll need to do is things like just, I mean, a lot of these can be done with reducing and removing that surface mud so that it doesn't get hard and compacted and become a ankle twister in the summer months. There's drainage improvements that we may need to do in places and also some element of um, resurfacing or top dressing. So once we've taken the mud off, actually putting a little bit of hard surfacing back down to help that recover. I thought it would be um, an idea to show and share with you some of the pictures showing that really illustrate the problems that we've been dealing with and that people are suffering with. So we've got the Basic Canal for Towpath there. Um, and Staunton Country Park, uh, which I know um, the, the friends of Staunton have tried to get some funding together for improving the route around the lake. And um, this is certainly one of our top priorities for our country parks um, to improve because it's so well used and has been over the last um, few months. Uh, and then uh, a couple of other footpaths that you'll see and where they particularly go through pinch points or between two um, fences, you can see how much they get really um, damaged as well, where they're not able to spread. Uh, it's not all been doom and gloom, of course. Not only have people really appreciated getting out in the countryside, but we also have um, developed some new new partnerships, such as Project Stride, which is a parish has come to us and wants to help by replacing stars with gates and promote that responsible use that we've also just received some funding from the Armed Forces Covenant Fund to set up a project walking with ex-servicemen and women um, walking, called Walking with the Wounded, where they will undertake works to improve the rights of way network. And some of that money will go towards materials to do that. And I think we have had a lot of very positive responses on the way that we've managed um, the countryside and people really being grateful for having um, the sort of network that we do in Hampshire. So in summary, yes, we've seen a high level of use during lockdown, which has had a negative impact. But on the plus side, um, people really appreciate 
the fact that they can get out and enjoy the countryside and take their active um, enjoyment as well as their mental um, well-being that they get from from being out and about and connecting with nature and this investment will really help that those rights of way and countryside paths um, keep them open for for many months and years for people to enjoy thank you thank you that was very interesting um and i've got already got a question councillor branson Um, not so much a question, but uh, thank you, Joe, for that. That was really interesting. And I'm really pleased that you've got Staunton Country Park on your um, radar because um, anybody who hasn't been there recently, one, all the lovely improvements that we've had from the um, lottery bid, um, you cannot walk around the lake at the moment and a lot of people arrive in the car park there's some lovely paths all at the top but the walk around the lake which is the circular lake which most people will probably do because there's a lot of people who aren't really strong uh, you know hardened walkers there um you know once they get a sort of a certain way they have to stop and come back because there's no way you can walk around so uh, just thank you very much for putting that on your radar and um, i look forward to hearing a positive outcome Thank you, Councillor Branson. I have been out to see that one myself because I yeah. heard how bad it was. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Briggs. Okay, you need to unmute. Can't hear you. <laughs> you nearly <laughs> escaped me. Thank you. <laughs> um, Joe, I was also going to go on about Staunton. But I wanted to ask, are you putting down a path so people with disabilities um, can use it? Um, because when the reservoir will be built, they are putting in a path for people with disabilities. And I think it's important for us to, to remember that sometimes it's difficult, because as you know, I just love the countryside. and. And it's been lovely seeing all the families out and the children. And um, I think we should do perhaps a bit more for people with a, with a disability. So if perhaps when you do Staunton and the canal, you can perhaps put down a harder base so people can access it. But you are doing a great job, Joe. And um, I just I just think we're so lucky in Hampshire to have all our footpaths and. And I don't mind the muddy, but I do feel sorry for the farmers when the paths get wider and wider, especially mm. going through a crop field. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Councillor Briggs, and I will take that back to the team as well. I have noticed that there is um, people using the, that particular path um, in, in motorised wheelchairs, at least, um, quite regularly. So, but I will take that back to the team. And I've got Councillor Carter. Well, yes, thank you, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, thank, thank you, uh, Joe, for that uh, detailed uh, report. It's uh, very interesting. Um, yes, many more people walking on our paths, and we've had some of the worst weather in in in, in years. So I I, um, I I thoroughly recommend uh, support the recommendations. Um, if I if I've got a question, I'd, I'd just like to know how the the sensory garden it, 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 is the path around the sensory garden still, or is the sensory garden not open at the moment? How I was because that I've been there, I've taken people to that a few times, and it's um, it's quite amazing. So how is the path around that um, holding up? Well, I think it was closed um, for quite a long time, actually, Councillor Carter, because of the the sort of. Um, uh, tight nature of the site um but actually um it's essentially gone at leap you mean yes, yes 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 but i think it's all surface that path it's either you know it's the bridge or the it's all got um it's all surfaced all oh, the way I've around all the way around yeah yeah <laughs> yeah the, the team have done a great job in in surfacing the um volunteers have done a fantastic job in surfacing that so i think it's all surface but it was closed for quite a long time because it's it's a very small site isn't it and i think it's very difficult to keep yeah. maintain a distance yeah. at one point so okay well thank you well very well done thank, thank, thank you. you and i've got councillor benison 
Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. Good report. Well done. Um, two questions, please. Uh, you mentioned about parish councils and the signs that you were going to perhaps send to them. Um, I really like that sign. I'd like to have seen the um, New Zealand sign, um, which I suspect was a little bit more robust. Um, but I've got a placer for those. So would it be possible for you to send round to the committee the link that, for these signs when you when you get them? Uh, and the other thing was about um, grass cutting for the uh, last year we we missed out with a contractor. So how what are we going to do this year? Are we going to try and get another contractor in or are we going to uh, do it ourselves with the teams? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Benson. I will send a link round. Um, the uh, litter sign is actually available and I'll, I'll make sure um, members are aware of how they can get hold of that. Um, now, but the intention is that we will have a downloadable toolkit online so that um, landowners and parish council can go and actually just download the sign that they need. And that will be um, beyond just litter. It will also talk about things like how to keep, you know, your dogs under control or um, issues relating to shutting gates or leaving gates open or anything else that they might want that we often get asked for individually. Um, we are going to let the contract again this year. We have revised the um, priority cutting list um, this year to make a little bit of saving because I think we found that we could do that as well as then shift a little bit more to what we can deliver um, ourselves. But uh, the impact of not having volunteers doing some of that work for us has actually been telling this year. So um, we are really looking forward to getting our volunteers back up and running. We have um, just the sheer amount of hours that's done by our volunteers, not just on the right of the way, but and uh, country parks and I know members will be aware of that because yeah. some of them are involved themselves um is um has been is huge and so the knock-on for us has been has been massive um this year we've been down 60 or percent if not more at times so um that will really help us as well as letting the contract this year so the, the staff can get on with uh, doing other jobs such as running the path recovery program <laughs> which they'll need to do <laughs> Thank you. Now uh, I've got Councillor Hare. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. That was a lovely presentation. I always love your presentations. They're always smart. Um, thank you. Um, two quick questions. One is if a footpath is running through private land mm -hmm. and there's a drainage issue, so would the landowner be responsible for, for the drainage or will Hampshire do it? And um, if, if it's a landowner, if they don't comply, what actions do you take? And my second question is regarding the volunteers. I take it, you know, we've lost lots of volunteers. Uh, what do you have in place to try and recruit more more volunteers? Um, I'll take the first, second one first, if that's okay, Councillor Hare. Um, and thank you for your kind words. Um, we, we haven't lost any, actually. They're desperate to come back. It's just being able to manage them under the current COVID guidance that's been the issue. And obviously those that are shielding have previously as well. Um, so that's more the case. In fact, they're, they're so desperate. We What we have been doing is keeping in touch with all our volunteers. Um, we've also improved some of our volunteer information um, and um, managing them now online so they can sign in and sign out online. So we've reduced the need for paper. So there's been quite a lot of developments with how we manage our volunteers. Um, and they've been, uh, we've had some very positive responses to them about how much we've been in touch with them, even though they haven't been able to come and work for us. So that's a positive um, that we won't be needing to do huge amounts of recruiting, but always welcome, obviously, um, more volunteering to help us deliver services. The second one, um, I'm not sure it's that straightforward. I think if it's affecting the surface, we're responsible for the surface of the path. So drainage that helps with the surface of the path, we would undertake some of those works ourselves. Um, I think each case is slightly different. We have got action we can take if needs be. Often we would undertake the work ourselves and we can recharge or we can you know, write to landowners requesting them to undertake works that need, are needed in order to keep the paths open um, and accessible. But I think where drainage is a complex, if it's actually affecting the surface, we are responsible for the surface, so we would probably undertake that work ourselves. Well, th 
thank you very much indeed, Joe, for well, not you're not I'm one of the people who really enjoys your presentations too. <laughs> um, that brings us to the recommendations, and I think this is another vote, isn't it? Because we're recommending to the executive member for recreation, heritage, countryside and rural affairs that he notes the impact of the increased use and weather conditions on the rights of way network and paths at country parks and countryside sites in Hampshire and approves the establishment of a £500,000 path recovery programme to carry out remedial works to improve the condition of the worst affected rights of way and countryside paths from 2021 to 22 to be funded from the CCBS accumulated cost of change reserve. Chairman, I can see all members uh, voting for the recommendation, so they are carried. Very satisfactory. Oh, I see that um, Chairman. Felicity has her hands up. Yeah. I'm Could so I sorry. Just that's all right. Um, just very quickly, two things. Just firstly, to thank Rebecca um, for the previous presentation and Joe for this one. Um, and also, actually, perhaps formally in front of the committee to recognise Joe as an interim um, assistant director and Emma Noyce, who's coming on next, as the other one. And they, those two um, people are adding hugely um, to the strength of the departmental management team. And I'm extremely excited to have them on board. So um, that's fantastic. Um, I just wanted to say that Joe is doing exactly the same presentation to the all member briefing tomorrow. So unless you want to see her twice, and perhaps some of you do from the comments, um, then you can um, switch off on that one. But um, the county farms briefing tomorrow is not the same presentation. And so if your appetite has been whetted, it would be well worth you going to the member briefing on the county farms tomorrow. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, and we've done the recommendations. And now we come to the the future strategy of the Winchester Discovery Centre. So first of all, it'll be Emma Noyce with a report and presentation. Emma. Good afternoon, members. Um, I'm in uh, here today in the capacity of, as Felicity said, Interim Assistant Director for Cultural and Information Services, which is a new sub-directorate within the department bringing together um, our offer around libraries and archives and cultural services. I'm joined today by Paul Sapwell, the Chief Executive of Hampshire Cultural Trust, um, who I'll just give a wave to so you can see. I think you all know Paul as well. Um, I just wanted to introduce him before I share the presentation, which I will now do. Has that popped up for you yet? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. So we're we're here today to talk about the uh, proposed partnership for Winchester Discovery Centre. I think you probably all know the Discovery Centre well. It's one of three Discovery Centres in Hampshire. The other two being. Gosport and Basingstoke. The difference uh, in Winchester Discovery Centre is that it does have, um, it is part of a large cultural venue. So it's a, an important community hub. It delivers a fantastic range of services under the roof and it is a very popular building. It's Hampshire's busiest library and it's the third most visited county library in the country with over half a million visits a year. It is, however, an expensive building to run. So the net cost to the County Council of Winchester Discovery Centre is £830,000 a year. Um, and on the slide, you can see just the range of services that are offered from the venue. I just want to be really clear that this, this, um, this narrative, it's not a story of a building that's failing, which, which we need to rescue. In, I, I particularly want to recognise the fact that in the last five years, the County Council staff who operate the Discovery Centre have done a huge amount of work to reduce the running costs and improve the offer from the building. However, we have done some work to understand what the opportunities are um, around the Discovery Centre. And we recognise that there's a real opportunity for a more intensive use of the spaces within the building to really enable that, that venue to realise its full potential as a large cultural venue and to generate more income to support those running costs. 
We have done some business planning work and that indicated that it would be possible for the library service to continue that journey to increase income and decrease costs through maintaining that current delivery model. However, those benefits would be marginal. Instead, we felt that a partnership model would deliver the best possible outcomes for customers and offer the best opportunity to protect the long term financial viability of the building. So today's presentation proposes a new partnership with Hampshire Cultural Trust that will bring financial benefits for both organisations that will improve the customer experience and support that long term financial viability of the building. And I think moreover, it really helps to position Winchester Discovery Centre as a, as a strategically important hub for culture and creativity in Hampshire. So before I, I go on, I just wanted to pass over to um, Paul Sapwell just to introduce some of the work in the context of the Hampshire Cultural Trust. Paul. Thank you, Emma. Um, good afternoon, members. Um, you probably recall, I think I was here a year ago just before COVID or was it uh, just before that talking uh, about an overview of the trust, but just to remind you who we are, we were set up in 2014 by Hampshire County Council, Winchester City Council, um, and we're the largest independent cultural trust in England and the largest countywide cultural organisation in Hampshire. Um, we operate 23 uh, venues um, on behalf of the county and the city. And what's quite unique about Hampshire Cultural Trust compared to many of the other cultural trusts across the, uh, across England certainly is that we run museums, art centres and of course performance venues um, and, and art galleries. So we host a variety of cultural output and our scope is incredibly wide. Um, most cultural organisers, most cultural trusts uh, tend to operate either museums or individual um, art centres. Um, since we were set up in 2014 as a as an independent charitable trust, we've uh, absorbed a 30% reduction in local authority funding across the piece. That hasn't all come from Hampshire, of course. We're funded from uh, Winchester City Council and a number of district and boroughs as well, but absorbed a, a, a reduction there of £1.2 million pounds per annum. But at the same time, since our first year of audited accounts, we've increased our earned income on uh, performance and commercial through food and beverage and retail, um, events um, and performances by 44% and we've raised uh, over £5 million in external fundraising. We've also invested, uh, having made a small surplus every year, um, we've, we've actually been investing back into the county buildings across, um, uh, county and city buildings uh, across our portfolio last year, investing over £200,000 in, in milestones. Um, within the Discovery Centre, we operate the gallery and city space. You'll be aware the city space gallery at the front, the community-led gallery, is operated on behalf of Winchester City Council. And between the two, we welcome about 70,000 visitors to these galleries each year. It's not an insubstantial part of the visitor economy in um, in, in Winchester, actually, um, those, those 70,000. You'll also be aware that since we've taken over those galleries, we've hosted a programme of world-class exhibitions since 2014, including, of course, Turner and the Sun. We led on the Jane Austen celebrations there with a royal uh, visit back um, back then. Uh, in 2019, which seems a long time ago now, we brought the BP Portrait Award to Winchester, and we've also showcased up-and-coming artists, self-curated exhibitions. So we've We've, we've built our success on a strong reputation for digital investment, commercial approach very much to pricing and promotion and a very high staff and volunteer uh, level of engagement. And this year I was delighted that we took part in the um, uh, a, a Pulse survey run by the company that runs the um, Sunday Times top 100 lists of companies to work for. And our staff actually indicated in that one-off survey that had we taken part in the main process, we would have indeed been one of the top 100 not-for-profits to work for in the country. So we're really proud of what we've achieved and, uh, and, and looking forward through this partnership to doing more together with, with um, our founding um, local authority, Hampshire at the Discovery Centre. Back over to you. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Yeah. Like a double act. Here we go.
So um, what we're proposing today is a new partnership that will really further develop the Discovery Centre as a vibrant arts, cultural and learning centre for Winchester. Hampshire Cultural Trust is the identified partner and as Paul said, um, the Cultural Trust already run established services within the building and we do have a substantial existing partnership agreement with the Cultural Trust. The, the proposal we're recommending um, does really represent quite a significant departure from the current operating model. So the proposal would see the operational management of the building passed to Hampshire Cultural Trust. And that means Hampshire Cultural Trust managing the space, operating the cafe and running the cultural programme. Hampshire County Council for its part would continue to run the library service from the building. And we would expect the, to see um, the library offer maintained and even enhanced through this partnership. And on the slide in the top corner, you can see the overall vision for the new venue, a, pro a progressive centre for the enjoyment and the ex um, expression of creativity and the pursuit of learning for the people of Winchester and beyond. So we're really excited by the prospect of this partnership. In terms of what this means um, commercially, so the partnership is intended to deliver financial benefits to both organisations, as you'd, as you'd expect. Um, the list of bullets indicates the, original, um, the overall financial principles underpinning the model. So in the initial setup phase, there will be a need for both organisations to invest in the, in the model to pump prime the project. That's both capital and revenue investment. In the first year, we, we, uh, each party should break even and certainly be no worse off than the current position. And by um, year two, both parties should be seeing financial benefits out of this arrangement. It's probably really important to say that under the model, the responsibility for, the op for all the operational costs, apart from those linked to, directly to the provision of the library service, um, together with the benefit of all that income, would um, transfer to Hampshire Cultural Trust. So for its part, the, cultural, the County Council will provide an annual grant to the Cultural Trust to cover the operational costs for, for running the building, but the Cultural Trust therefore carry the commercial risk and the responsibility for generating income from the venue. Um, and the model provides the County Council with that future financial certainty. We know where we are, we know what the grant amount is every year. Uh, provided that the executive member approves the proposals tomorrow, we will need to do fi further work on that deta detailed financial business case. In terms of the staffing impact, I know um, impact on our staff is very close to um, members of this committee's heart, and I know that's something you take very seriously. So overall, the number of staff employed in the building um, will remain largely the same, but over the next four years, we'd expect the proportion employed by Hampshire Cultural Trust to increase and the proportion um, employed by Hampshire County Council to decrease. Hampshire Cultural Trust will deliver those front of house services, so the visitor and cafe, as well as the cultural programming. And staff, um, staff providing the library services will continue to be em employed by Hampshire County Council to support the operation of the library offer. HC, HC3S staff who work in the cafe would transfer over to Hampshire Cultural Trust where appropriate. And we will need to model staffing levels. So our staffing reductions will be managed wherever we can through the natural turnover, um, but if over time those reductions cannot be made through vacancy management, then we will need to look at formal processes to, um, to follow. But it's important to say that overall new opportunities and new roles will be developed within Hampshire Cultural Trust's um, element of the building. From a property point of view, I think it's safe to say that um, I think the, the building was reopened um, probably around 12 years ago now um, after its last refurbishment. And it's, it's starting to show the effects of those half a million visitors a year. So what we're saying is that achieving the shared vision will require a, ra a range of improvements to the building. And we are working with the Cultural Trust to develop um, a scheme um, which is funded largely, largely through corporate capital with, um, with a contribution from Hampshire Cultural Trust and also seeking grant funding possibly from the Arts Council for some elements of the scheme. And what we're looking at doing is uh, refurbish cafe bar and toilets improvement to some of the key spaces in the building so the children's library and city space gallery relocation of some of the library book stock to enable some better customer flow within that building creation of new welcoming spaces within the venue and the development of a unique new brand identity to really encapsulate this this new joint venture we would target um, our target date for the completion of those works is february 2022 so just in summary then, a summary of the benefits. So from a financial perspective, um, um, 
we would expect to see financial benefits to both organisations, including significant efficiency savings, um, to secure operational efficiencies related to the management of the building, to really maximise that income potential, potential offered by the opportunities within the Discovery Centre, and to enable us to make joint funding applications to organisations like the Arts Council, who have really indicated that they do like the idea of a library service and an arts organisation in partnership. From a customer perspective, um, it's about enhancing that customer journey and improving the experience really continuing to grow a diverse and improved cultural program and increasing public access to the building by increasing the provision and also extending opening hours. And from an organisational point, point of view, it really does help us to secure the long term viability of the venue and to grow participation and hopefully again increase visitor numbers through time. So a summary of the uh, timeline, I won't go through this in detail, suffice it to say that we've done some high level work on the vision and scoping of the business case, that's complete. We're coming to you today for, um, for your um, thoughts and recommendations in terms of the proposal we're putting to the executive member tomorrow. Um, we are communicating with staff and trade unions about this change at the moment and we're working through the heads of terms and the detailed financial model. Into the summer, um, we're looking at a phase, uh, developing a, real, a plan for the transition and formation of a partnership agreement with the Cultural Trust to enable us to move forward on this. And in um, the autumn of this year, the commencement of the capital works with a view, as I say, to handing over in February next year. I won't reiterate all the recommendations, um, but suffice it to say that we're looking, um, we're asking the select committee to recommend that the executive member approves the plans to proceed with the proposed partnership model, the commercial principles, notes the HR implications and authorises us to take any other steps as necessary to progress this partnership. It's probably useful to say that there are other decisions which fall under Councillor Reid, um, the Executive Member for Commercial Strategy, Human Resources and Performance and his decision day, and that's around the property arrangements, um, the refurbishment programme and the 2P arrangements for the HC3S staff. So that's um, the presentation, happy to take any questions on that. Thank you very much indeed, um, Emma. That was extremely clear um, and very interesting and I think fundamentally optimistic, which is good. Um, Councillor Benison, your hand is up. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Emma, for the um, presentation. Uh, very perceptive. We're all very keen on the staff. So, um, what sort of numbers are we talking about uh, that are going to be affected by this? The library staff, I, as you've said, are going to uh, carry on as they are. But uh, what numbers of staff are we talking about in the rest of the building? I, we're, we're currently doing that work on the detailed business case, so I can't give you precise numbers. But what we are looking at is the library service staff who do a range of functions within the building, um, really just managing that down so that the library service staff are responsible for the library offer only and don't get um, caught up in things like room booking or cultural programming. So it's likely to be a reduction in management, a transfer of um, cafe staff to HC3S, and then a reduction in library staff um, commensurate with what we need to do with them to do in terms of library functions within the building. But it's also important to note that the staff working at the Discovery Centre are part of a wider cluster. So in the in the recent change we made um, around the staff consultation, they work across a range of libraries in that cluster, um, including um, places like Eastleigh and, and um, other um, Alsford and other other libraries in that area. So it's about looking at the the whole um, structure and where we can deploy staff when they're most needed. Thank you, Thank you. Councillor Hiscock. Thank you, Chair. Actually, it's, it's more debate than a um, than a question that I have. Would you rather I come back for debate when all the questions no, no. are finished? Yes. Okay. Finish. Right. I just like to say that um, I'd like to thank everybody who's been working on this project. At first, after we had our last meeting where it was clear that we we're going to start losing hours at the Discovery Centre, it was very disappointing, and the people um, who I represent were disappointed by that. So we are very appreciative of what's been done and the moves that have taken place with 
Paul Sapwell and, and, and Emma Noyce. And um, we're grateful to it. We think it's probably a good thing. Uh, it will secure the future of our library, which is, as you can see from the numbers, is tremendously well used and has become, since it became a discovery centre, a very important part of Winchester life. And if this helps it to continue and grow more, and provide new opportunities. I'm very happy to support it. And I, um, Paul did his um, presentation last night to a group of city councillors as well, and they were enthusiastic about it too. So I'd just like to say thank you to that, and I look forward to having it um, actually there working as, as it's described. So thank you. But I think it's. I think it's. I've been to such wonderful exhibitions. That it seems a really very very positive thing to say. Yeah, we're going, we're going to share this properly, and I'm sure it'll ensure the survival of both institutions as one institution, which I think I think is wonderful. Oh, Councillor Chagrin. Thank you, Chairman. Hopefully, you can hear me. Um, interesting presentation. Great to hear the view of um, my colleague, Councillor Hiscock, as um, local member. Um, whether it does save the future of the building, of course, none of us will know until some years to come, um, by which time many of us may not even be on this council. Indeed, the council may not exist. But my, my concern, as with other proposals with the Cultural Trust, and this is in no way a criticism of them, but this will be another public building no longer run by a democratically elected or publicly accountable local authority. And I just feel on all of these, I, I do have that reservation. Um, I do also note that when Paul was last here, um, he did mention that quite a lot of, I think about 160 of the current staff in um, the Cultural Trust uh, weren't going to get their jobs back post furlough. Mainly it was part time. I see him shake his head, so I'll be grateful if you can confirm that. Um, if, if that's not so, I stand corrected. Um, but as I say, I do have reservations simply, and it's not a criticism of the trust, and or, or indeed of the council, I understand why it's being done. But just in principle, I prefer to have public buildings run by elected and accountable authorities. That's just the way I am. Um, and um, I hope you respect my view, even if you don't agree with it. Um, one question I will ask Paul, and I hope he, he can give me assurances on. When the Discovery Centre was set up, um, one of its purposes was to replace the Tower Art Centre, much loved in Winchester, which was effectively closed very soon afterwards. And for a while in the Discovery Centre, there was a very good cultural programme in the 160-seat theatre. That programme has declined slowly um, over the years, um, slowly and significantly. Could be argued partly because there's the Theatre Royal alongside, but the Theatre Royal with something like 420 seats caters for different shows than the Discovery Centre could provide, and indeed the Tower, which was a superb art centre, did used to provide. Can Paul um, just explain what plans he will have if this goes ahead, as I'm sure it will, um, to revitalise specifically that side of the Discovery Centre offering? Because it was very important at the start. It has gone down. This council has failed to deliver. And if the Cultural Centre, the Cultural Trust can do that part better, then all to the good, that side at least, I would certainly support. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Paul, are you going to... Yes, of course. OK, thank you, Councillor Chegwin. Um, first of all, I must come back on the point about um, staff not returning after furlough. That is entirely incorrect. And I did not say that staff were not returning after furlough to the Cultural Trust. The, um, the Cultural Trust um, has had to make some difficult positions, uh, decisions during this year, as all cultural organisations have had to do in terms of looking at the viability. But... Um, literally in terms of numbers of jobs that have been at risk um, as a result of the pandemic, unlike most cultural institutions, has, has literally been uh, um, uh, one or two um, positions. So most of our staff, indeed all of our staff who were, who, who were furloughed, bar a, a couple of positions, are returning to work at the Trust. And one of the successes of the Cultural Trust actually has been in facing the pandemic and being in a resilient position to be able to face that that pandemic um, in comparison to many of our peers. Um, so I, I can't accept that figure. Um, just another point in terms of, uh, as you say, Councillor Chegwin, I, I do not um, 
I, I respect um, uh, your view um, on uh, the 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 idea that the the building should be run by a, a publicly accountable body. But I would point out that the cultural trust is very much not in, entirely independent, if you like, from the scrutiny and uh, the funding and the oversight of the county and, and, and city councils which set it up. I mean, it was very careful at the time in terms of how we were constituted to ensure that representation on our board by um, elected uh, members. And, and, and so I would, uh, I, it's not the same as simply privatising it, if you like. Um, so I think that's an important point to make. In terms of the um, performance programme, um, I, absolutely, part of um, the principle of this partnership is to grow the performance programme in that space um, where we have a track record of doing so in the other three art centres that we that we run across the county. Uh, you'll be aware that we run um, Ashcroft Art Centre in the West End in Aldershot and um, the uh, Forest Art Centre in New Milton. Um, and we have seen growth in performance and growth in profitability and growth in numbers since we've been running those in 2014. Um, actually, the vision for us is that the performance element of the di Discovery Centre at that level, at the, with the, the level of seating that it has, is comparable to those art centres as opposed to a larger theatre and therefore um, would fit very um, uh, well into the current um, artistic programme that we're running across the county and actually strengthen that with a, with another venue. So part of the financial model that we've talked about at a high level is, is a growth in that programme and profitability of that programme and certainly a much um, wider use of the performance space and of course the, the opening in the, in the evenings in order to do that. Um, so uh, everything that comes with that sort of um, the performances which are uh, that's part of as Emma alluded to the increased um, access hours to the Discovery Centre that we're proposing. Hopefully that answers the questions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Is that all right, Councillor Jacob? Okay. Um, Emma, you wanted to add to this. I, I, and I think I was just going to reassure Councillor Chegwin that there will be um, obviously a service level agreement with the Cultural Trust um, that we remain the grant funders of the operational element and there will be a break clause in the contract as well so we will be able to review performance and make sure that we're clear on what the performance figures figures are for um, the partnership. Thank you. Well, I think now we've got to the recommendations for this too um, and I think I'd like to take these, would you like to take them in, in two bits? I mean, the recommendations to, to the Executive Member for Recreation and Heritage and the other lot to the Executive Member for Commercial Strategy and Human Resources. What do you think? So, Chairman, just, uh, Emma, Chairman you, just to be clear that the first four recommendations are for the committee to actually propose to the Executive Member for Recreation and Heritage the other recommendations are for the committee to note that it's not within the committee's remit to recommend to the executive member okay. for commercial strategy. There are ones noting and ones that. That's okay. Correct. We've got the first lot, which we better vote on now. So we'll take them all together. I can see, Chairman, that the majority of members are voting for those recommendations, so they are carried. And then the committee would just need to note the, the second part of the recommendations. Right, so we Which can just can be vote, we don't need to vote on that. That's yeah, we can we can do that verbally, it's just to make just okay, we just note it. Thank you very much. And that we're nearly there. <laughs> We've got the work programme next. Um, which looks, we've got through a lot today. And then we haven't got very much the re for the rest of um, the year, but I, we have got we need to we need to put in an update on the library service, I think. Would members agree? 
I think we had the last one. Um, I was looking at it the other day. I think that will in be September. due in, in, it was September, in September 2020, according to this. So we so could do it. Would we like to put, put that in for September? Yeah. Um, Emma agree. Hmm? And then we're going to put in, aren't we, um, the the question of looking at the um, based on on Felicity's presentation we had on the on the, on the effects of COVID. To be looking at that, I think the question whether we leave it till do it in September, but I think we might be more satisfactorily spaced from it in November. If that yeah, no, November does feel more um, sensible. I think that gives it a better yeah. chance of having yes. a clearer idea. Yeah. Would there not be some update that you would want to do, Felicity? Um, I can do it on an as-needs basis. I think um, yeah. November will give me a chance to give you a sort of look back. Um, yeah. if, there's, if there's anything urgent, we can obviously bring it in. September, October, I suspect, we'll be bringing um, the early SP23 um, proposals as well. So that will probably come in the, your direction, but that will have to come in on a corporate programme. Um, I will make sure that you get um, sort of pre-scrutiny or scrutiny of, of, of any significant decision day items for Councillor Heron. Um, there's not an awful lot coming up, but I think on the full programme, we should have a, a briefing on regulatory services um, in June. So I would be expecting that to be on that agenda. Oh. But anyhow, that definitely did to be put in for the, for the 29th of November. Has anyone yes. else got any ideas? Um, Madam Chairman, um, the, uh, it's been a little while since we've heard from the Basingstoke Canal uh, my, I don't know if that's a possibility to go into some future agenda. Joe, is that your? Yes, that's under and my remit. I'm happy to uh, bring an update on the basin now. Um, would you, I think, in June to do an update on transforming County Council Country Parks, which has sort of got to the end of a phased the sort of main phase of that delivery. So we were going to bring that as a sort of um, just feedback on how that programme's gone and the difference that it's made. Um, but we could do Basingstoke Canal either as part of that, if you like, as part of an overall briefing. I think as part of that would be very sensible. Rather Joe. than separate yeah, item. Bit, what yes. would be, what would be, oh, I've well, got that. So that will be part of the 18th of June. Meeting. What about yes. what about the cultural trust? Do we have a a yearly yes, update? We, have on? A, we I can't remember when the last one was. Uh, well, it's down here is September last year. Yes, and I believe there are plans that we should either bring something to June or September again. So uh, what, September. For the cultural trust. Yes. What do you think, September? I suggest September because I, I think by I that think time the, the, the Winchester Discovery Centre will have landed and exactly. we can. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and also it just gives more chance for recovery to have happened too. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. And that's September as well. So we'll have three items and that's probably right. There's nothing in November. But I expect it's got plenty of time to appear. Yeah. So that brings that brings me to the end of the um, end end of the meeting. Ch um, Chairman. Yes. Just before we fi finish, um, I I don't know how many members are standing down, but I believe you are, and You're I believe quite... Councillor Carter as well is. Um, I, I seem to spend a, an awful lot of my time at county council meetings praising Conservatives. Um, usually when they've just died. Um, so I hope you won't mind me just I once hope I'm not gonna die, yes. saying thank I'm you um, to one who hasn't died. I know I can be a little thorn in the flesh at the times, and I'm not normally praiseworthy of Conservatives. And I do question whether the arts and culture offering from the county is what it was a few years ago. 
But I would say you've been a good chairman for this scrutiny board well, thank and you. will be missed, um, generally missed, as will Chris Carter. I did pay tribute to the council, which I think he found rather hard to stomach coming from me. But, <laughs> but um, you have been good. And this has been a nice board to serve on. Um, most of uh, certainly you conservatives, you're all conservative apart from three of us. Um, you, you're nice conservatives, um, the kind of conservatives <laughs> I, I like being on the board with. And I, I would well, hope in our different ways we all fight for the service back. because if we don't, but, others of our colleagues certainly well, don't. So well, I wish you um, a long and happy retirement and I hope we might occasionally see you back in, in some form. Um, but thank you. It has well, been appreciated. Well, thank You've given all of you. Because the one thing you certainly have done, Councillor Jedwin, is you've made things more interesting at times. <laughs> <laughs> so, I thank you for that. Um, and very much for what you've just said. And I'd like to thank all of you. I thought, I mean, you know, there, there, we were all agreeing on every, on every vote, which was really yeah. lovely. So I didn't, I didn't see the last one. But anyhow, um, Chairman, can I, can I just uh, thank Councillor Chegwin for for, yeah. for his comments there? Uh, and also, we should note that uh, Councillor Zilia Brooks will not be returning. Also, Z I Zilia, I think, is in this committee today. So she, she, she will be retiring also. Yes, so well, you'll have a completely new look when we've all gone. Um, yes. Well, I just want to thank you, and it's very sad, and, and, and it's been increasingly interesting, this, the work we've done, I think. Jen, so are you happy for me very, to end very the much. broadcast? What? Are you happy for me to end the broadcast, Chairman? Oh, yeah. Yes, I think so. Thank Sorry. You very